So yesterday we were into this particular topic, right? We were into yeah, we were into the hotel industry and we were seeing that different different parameters on which they check the uh, particular sector. They check the performance of a particular firm in a particular industry. So capital adequacy is what we have to discuss from here. So capital adequacy typically refers to some monetary measure for a firm's risk of a firm's risk, both operational and financial uh, as percentage of its equity capital. That means how much a company or a particular business should always maintain with itself so that it is always in safer zone. OK, and never would have the deficiency of funds. That is what capital adequacy means. So some monetary measure with this we can definitely know about a firm's risk. If a firm has very less capital adequacy ratio, the firm is more riskier. If it has more capital, if it has proper adequacy ratio, let's say if a firm should maintain a 25% of capital always and it is maintaining just 10% more risky. This is less risky because this is abiding with rules and guidelines. Regulators monitor capital adequacy ratios to ensure that a financial firm has a buffer to absorb losses. As I said right now, this is more riskier, less riskier. A common measure of capital risk is value at risk VAR, V A R. This you will be studying in the risk management concept as well which is an estimate of the money size money size of loss that a firm will exceed only some specific percentage of time over a specific period of time. So this is nothing but. I will show you with the help of an example. You may have an idea about normal distribution. This is a normal distribution curve. It is a bell shaped curve. OK, this is the standard deviation and VAR V A R that is 95% confidence interval. I know these are very new things for you and 5% significance level. So let's say this is the 95% this see this entire thing is 100% area. This is the average or mean. OK, this is 50% right side 50% left side. This is uh, exa mean is always at the center. Hence we can divide this into two parts. That is what we call it as a symmetry. Symmetry is two equal parts. So uh, like if at all, let's say you have invested in some particular investment option. You have invested $100,000. OK. And let's say uh, VAR has a formula. Asset value into standard deviation into there is a formula and. And let's say like twelve thousand dollars is the loss you are going to bear OK, that means there is going to be a loss of twelve thousand. Let's say that twelve thousand comes here. OK, so VAR measures that particular loss or particular risk of you losing this particular amount. So let's say uh, there is a bank. OK, let's leave about the investment option. Let's say there is a bank which always gives certain loans in a particular day. And the bank is always concerned about the defaults, right? So let's say the bank has calculated its value at risk for a one million dollar of loan. What it is giving on daily basis, it has calculated that twelve thousand dollars is what is the VAR. That means on a given day. Let so I am explaining you the interpretation of this twelve thousand amount on a given day. The bank is 95% confident. What is that? 95% confident that the loss var of 12,000. No need to go for calculation and other things because that is not there in your syllabus. And let me be very clear var is going to be eliminated from the risk management subject completely from the coming June 2024 onwards. Because it has so many deficiencies. There is a committee called Basel committee which always meets in a place called Basel which is in Switzerland and the Basel committee uh, like they, they take crucial decisions on risk management, right? So the Basel committee has uh, has given certain guidelines and they are against this war because they have seen that there are a lot of deficiencies in this 
value at risk concept so we may expect some other 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 metric to measure risk okay so what that metric is going to be it can be ex it can be excess uh, shortfall okay uh, like uh, you don't know all about this i really understand it's all new for you because i take frm course so i i i uh, deal with all this expected shortfall sorry it's expected shortfall that measures the tail risk that means var may measure only some area but very very deeper uh, like uh, it doesn't go okay and it won't study very deeper risk it studies only to some extent but not the total or deeper risk in a particular uh, like uh, investment option or banks giving loan to its cust uh, clients or customers etc okay so expected shortfall is going to be taking wars place is what we expect so the recent guidelines or journal of basel committee what they have released i haven't read but i have this idea because in textbooks also it is clearly printed that war is going to be eliminated from the syllabus in the in 2024 year and from june they are going to remove that so now what i am trying to explain you is let's say the cal that bank is giving a loan of 1 million dollar on daily basis and they have calculated var so 1 million dollar loan bank is giving to their clients on daily basis to various clients and they have calculated that uh, calculated the value at risk of that particular loans what they are giving okay this is an investment for bank right because they are lending the money and they are expecting returns on it so 12000 var they have calculated what is the meaning of this how will you interpret this so the bank is 95% confident that the that the the bank is 95% confident that the loss is going to be 12000 dollars on a given day and 5% so 95% they are confident that the loss is going to be uh, like uh, going to be to, uh, like uh, like uh, less than less than okay here i am putting the sign less than or equal to 12000 on a given day so bank is very confident on a given day they can really lose uh, some 12000 dollars okay and they are well prepared and they are uh, ready for that they are ready for that of course because they have calculated that it's they have calculated the var which says 12000 dollars is what they going to lose and being in this business they are very much well prepared for this see every businessman is well prepared for certain losses and that also to some extent but beyond that extent it is unacceptable for them or it is dangerous for them they cannot absorb that kind of loss so now with this var of 12000 dollars the bank is 95% confident that the loss is going to be uh, either equal to 12000 or less than 12000 on a given day but 5% there are chances that the loss can be more than 12000 dollars and they this is the area what they should be worried about this area this area till here it is 12000 let's say not not here sorry till here it is 12000 because that's the point at which we are having the confidence interval so bank is confirmed or bank is uh, like you know bank has calculated this amount of value at risk and they are uh, sure that on a given day they can lose this 12000 dollars and they are okay with that because they are well prepared for that they have uh, see there are different types of capitals a bank maintains okay so they have that particular capital operational capital to absorb the losses to the tune of 12000 dollars but they are really worried that 5% chances the losses can be more than 12000 dollars and they have to make a strategy how they can save themselves from this particular loss of more than 12000 right so this is what is the interpretation of value at risk since the since they have used this word var i have to give you good amount of details so i'm sharing with you what is the page number sorry the dew point is done yeah 
so <clears throat> banks are subject to minimum reserve requirements they have to always <clears throat> maintain reserve requirements their ratios of various liabilities of their central bank reserves must uh, be uh, above the minimums the ratio of a bank's liquid assets to certain liabilities is called its liquid asset requirement that means always they should be maintaining certain standards to run their operations that's what the uh, statement says the performance of financial companies that lend funds is often summarized as net interest margin because you know for lenders uh, the interest is what is the margin for them see we always being businessmen being into a business we calculate our margin on sales right so if we want to find out net profit margin it is net profit by net sales into 100 in the same way for the banks the lend whatever they lend okay is their investment and uh, net interest margin that means uh, interest uh, so what is that which is simply interest income whatever the interest income they get because that is what is their income right for us normal businesses like the people who are doing normal business net profit is the income for uh, uh, particular banks interest income is the income divided by firms interest earning assets so what can be the interest earning assets loans am i right because what we sell in the business is goods what they are selling is loan that's it now there is next point what we are discussing right now so as i said you right now they are going to discuss about certain concepts in the level 2 that is uh, var and all so leave it and you are going to learn about some uh, like in 2007 2008 there was a very big crisis which uh, which happened in united states and uh, in that crisis lehman brothers lehman brothers was a very big bank and there was a loss of 319 billion dollars in 2007 2008 which led to global financial crisis not much happened in india and i i think you were born during those times or you were in school during those times so you may not be knowing but this happened and it was it was a very big disaster what was the reason for that why it happened i think i have certain video i i want to share that with you you go through that today for extra information uh 2 minutes Mm, I think I have to send you separately. I'll try to send. Don't worry. Okay. Next is business risk. See, business risk is something which is uh, common for every business. So, what is a business risk? See, let us let's say there is a uh, there is a, a pharma company. There is a like you know mining company. these are different different industries there is a hotel this is also a different kind of industry right service industry uh, extraction based industry manufacturing that to different kind of manufacturing and then there is automobile all these are different different industry but they all have similar kind of business risk what is the businesses they have threats of new entrants entering into the market one of, one of the risks second bargaining power of customers bargaining power of suppliers taste and preferences of cost of uh, tradition preferences of the customers which changes with passage of time okay so these are some of the mentioned ones so what are they saying the standard deviation see standard deviation is what i will tell you that also with the help of a diagram see first of all standard deviation is a measure of risk i know this particular thing you have studied in your past or not 
if you have been a math student in your 10 plus 2, you definitely have learned about standard deviation. Standard deviation is nothing but how much you are deviating from your mean or from your from the observation. See, actually not observation from the mean. That is standard deviation. Let's say this is a normal distribution curve. And don't tell me, sir, we haven't learned normal distribution. Probability distribution was there in your intermediate. And this particular bell shaped curve, I'm explaining this was also there. I think Leibniz theorem and those areas like I think I think somewhere around it was there. Maybe I think distributions was there for you in intermediate, right? Come on, tell me yes or no. Come on, open the mouth and tell. So you have some idea about distributions? No, sir, I didn't have. You didn't have. What about you, Bhargava? No, sir, even I don't know what distribution is. Distribution, probability distribution. What is probability distribution? Okay, then what we will do is we will leave this topic until unless probability distribution is explained to you. Okay. Okay, simple. I will explain the probability distribution. Don't worry. See, probability distribution is not some big something very critical uh, thing to understand. See, suppose uh, suppose this is a particular graph. OK. Or this is a tabular representation. OK. What am I going to do here when you throw a die? A die has six sides, right? So probability of getting one in a die is how much? Come on, tell me. When you throw a die, you get one. What is that? One by six. One by six, definitely. What is the formula for this? Outcome by total outcomes. Outcome is just one. Because when you throw a die or roll a die, you will get only one of the faces and there are six faces it has, right? So the probability, so I threw a die, I got one and the probability was one by six. So observation and its probability. Then if I if I throw the die, if I get two, the probability would be one by six. Three, it will be one by six. Four, it will be one by six. Five, it will be one by six. Six, it will be one by six. So if at all, if at all, I am performing an experiment. I am getting some outcomes and those outcomes have a probability. I am putting them in a tabular representation. This can be repre this can be nothing but a distribution. This is a probability distribution in front of you. So probability distribution is nothing but for any experiment what you are performing or for for any experiment whatever you are performing, you may have certain outcomes and those outcomes may have probabilities. So outcomes and probabilities represented either in a tabular form or in a graphical form or in a distribution form, either in this way. All these are see not a not distribution form either in this way by showing a bell shaped curve. All these are probability distributions. Did you understand? Yes or no? Yes, sir. That's what. Isha, did you understand? Yes, sir. So there, there, there may be certain experiments you will be performing. Those experiments will have certain outcomes. Those outcomes may have certain probabilities. If at all one is coming, it has a probability of one by six. Outcome and their probabilities when represented in tabular form or in any form, either in graphical way. So if I put it this way, uh, if 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 there are like outcomes, one, two, three, four, five, six, and there are probabilities. So you know probability is always one by six, right? So one by six is how much boss? One upon six is 0 0.16. So it's like 0 0.15, 0 0.16. So probability of this is one, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0.16, 0.16, 0.16, 0.16. It is also a distribution, okay? So generally why, why I always take this is, this is actually discrete. We we take this as, this is, this is normal distribution. Normal distribution is a bell shaped curve. Here also we are showing probability and outcomes. But this is what is generally very much prevalent in statistics. OK. To show properly about certain uh, certain data whereby you expect something continuously. For example. 
if i want to know about the fall of rain okay so uh, fall of rain is not a discrete thing why it's not a discrete thing you can't count what uh, what what like how is the intensity of the rain right so you can put some range that is 2m uh, like uh, 20 mm to 40 mm let's say just a hypothetical example the rain will be between this range because rain can take any form right uh, like to 20.44 20.5896 20.8432 so between these two finite parameters or range any number of any value the rainfall can take so it is called continuous distribution what is that called come on tell me continuous distribution okay because here between these two range infinite values can be can be considered or taken so we always consider normal distribution so same is the case with returns if if at all you are uh, if you are consultant or your amc asset management company in which you have taken some sip or mutual fund tells you that the the returns will be in the range of 16% to 18% it can take any value 16.11 16.24 16.859 any value so that's what we consider normal distribution so i was explaining you about standard deviation right let's say let's say the i am i was speaking about standard deviation right so i was saying that standard deviation is a measure of risk standard deviation is a measure of risk standard deviation measures risk okay so let's say if you are expect if you have invested your money in a sip or a mutual fund and they are promising you a return of they say that sir on an average you will get returns of 15% on an average you will get a per a return of 15% average is nothing but mean okay and they say that there can be a standard deviation of 3% that means your returns can be 18% your returns can be 21% your returns can be 12% or it can be 9% that means standard deviation is nothing but it can be you on an average they are promising you a return of 15% but they are not denying any fact but they are not denying that there cannot be any kind of deviation they say that deviation can be of 3% that means your returns can at times be 3% more than your average returns or can be 3% less than your average returns did you understand now that's why we say standard deviation is equal to plus or minus 3% please tell me yes or no that is standard deviation okay now but you will come across certain concept called variance and standard deviation you will see in certain google you will be doing google search of course after the class because you will be very much curious to know about standard deviation and 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 uh, the the concepts which we have explained today or which we have discussed today and then while doing google search you will coming you will be coming across variance concept and this variance also is a measure of risk and then you will be coming to me tomorrow and asking me sir yesterday we discussed that standard deviation is a measure of risk but i found in google that variance is also a measure of risk i won't deny that these two are not measure of risk both of them are measure of risk but mind it you can never find out standard deviation directly if you want to find out standard deviation first you have to find out variance because root of variance is always equal to standard deviation come on tell me yes or no did you understand yes sir yes sir but this is not the proper understanding of the concept the concept should be understood with practical uh, calculation so we will calculate right now i am not diverting from the topic these are all this all will be covered in the future so i am giving some overview of all this today so let's say you have you have you have invested your money in a mutual fund and it is giving in 5 years it is giving you certain returns the returns are 10% it is for, uh, like 15% it's like 20% it's 25% 30% 40% 
30 percent i know these are very high returns okay maybe you are very lucky to get such 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 returns with your mutual fund and uh, here we want to find out the standard deviation our agenda is to find out standard deviation so how are we going to find out the standard deviation so i already told you you cannot find out the standard deviation directly because if these are the observations to find out standard deviation uh, the formula for variance i'll write it variance is equal to x minus x bar the whole square whole divided by n this is the formula for variance now let's say this is the mean the average is this okay in this data of 5 years let's say on an average i okay. made a return of hello yes sir sir one doubt sir yeah please tell me sir i think this is the formula for standard deviation and i think the square of standard deviation is called variance yeah square of standard deviation is variance so root of variance is standard deviation that's what i'm saying okay okay i said right root yes. of variance is equal to standard deviation so standard deviation square is variance yes right now so now let's say in this 5 years on an average i am earning 20% average so i'll take this and i'll take deviation from the mean uh, i will i will take the deviation of all this observations from their mean from their average so x minus x bar so 10 minus 20 is minus 10 50 minus 20 is minus 5 20 minus 20 is 0 25 minus 20 is 5 30 minus 20 is 10 now when i add when i do x minus x bar summation sum of the deviations should always be equal to 0 that is a property of mean so you will never get an answer for standard deviation directly that means if you think if you think standard deviation should be x minus x bar the x bar sigma x minus x bar by n then you will never get an answer in your lifetime because sum of the deviations is equal to 0 right so how we can find out the standard deviation then we have to square so we will get 100 we will get 25 0 25 100 and the uh, negatives have been converted to positive 200 and then this is 250 now you see sigma x minus x bar the whole square divided by n so 250 this is sigma x minus x bar the whole square divided by what is n 5 is it right or wrong hello right so so 50 let's say 49 approximately let's say let's say because you have a square root for 49 so your variance is 49 so your standard deviation would be 7 understood the one which you wouldn't have uh, like calculated directly you have to calculate via variance now i'll put a question to you now all of you please note it down i'll ask a question to you these calculations will be there in quantitative methods also yeah after finishing tell me
Have you finished this? Hello? Yes, sir. Yeah. Now my question to you is, this is a measure of risk. This is a measure of risk. So when can you use this and when can you use this? Come on. There are certain scenarios where you have to use them separately. Okay. So how if I speak about if I have if I want to buy or purchase a particular piece of land. OK, so you know land is in the shape of a rectangle or square, whatever. So I want to know the area of this land. So area will be in terms of what square meters. Am I right or meter square? Come on, tell me. Yes, sir. So now when I can when I have calculated this the area of this on average the area is 10 meter square but there can be a deviation of 2 meter square uh, either uh, like it can be 12 meter square or it can be 8 meter square i cannot rule out that deviation see whenever we do certain calculations so all calculations are approximate at times many a times because it's a complicated thing to calculate the exact area of something so i keep a deviation of 2 meter square in this case in this case square meters or meter square is a is a square measure, right? But if I want to get a, a, a to get a, a pant stitched from a tailor, I will be buying certain cloth, right? There I'll be considering meter or uh, square meters. Meter. Meters, and I can keep a deviation of let's say 1.6 meters are required to stitch a pant for some adult. Generally, if you go to a shop they'll give you 1.6 meters okay and i keep a deviation of uh, like uh, uh, 0.3 meters up and 0.3 meters down in this case why am i not considering square meters because i cannot consider okay so it depends upon the meter it depends upon the data what you are taking into consideration here meters cannot be taken here square meters cannot be taken and square meters root is meters right yes or no Yes. yes, that's what. So in these two cases, things will differ here. Variance would be applicable as a, as of I think your standard deviation would be more applicable. That's what. OK, we were into that. But, no, but in uh, terms of finance, uh, how do we differentiate between standard deviation, standard deviation always in, in the always. world of finance? Any kind of returns you take, always standard deviation. Okay. okay. So rule of thumb. So like from this example, you meant it like variance gives like the actual value. Variance and standard deviations give you, show you how much you are deviating from the average. How much? far you go from your average that much risky how much near you are to the average that much it is more certain right when someone is promising you 10 percent returns with a deviation of two percent less risky with a deviation of five percent more risky that means your returns can be 15 or 5. in first case it can be 12 or 8 which is more risky more volatile the second one right yes so no one in the world can give you accurate picture of the returns what they're going to earn uh, in the stock market stocks stock market uh, whatever the stocks are trading they are dependent on various factors it's not like government security which gives you eight which gives you assured eight percent returns and without any volatility without any deviation so this is a certain return so all the government securities whether it's treasury bill of united states they give 2%, they promise 2% returns and they give you 2%. But in stock market, mutual funds and all, you can't expect this certainty. Are you understanding? So there is a deviation. Okay. Now, the standard deviation of revenue, standard deviation of operating income and standard deviation of net income are all indicators of variation in and the uncertainty about a firm's performance. Did we discuss about this right now? Yes. The more the deviation, the more the risk, the less the deviation, the less the risk. The more you're near to the average, less risky. The more you're away from the average, more risky. Average is what we expect. So if you are very much away from the expectation, always very high risk. If you are very much near to the expectation, always less risk. Okay. 
so because they all depend on size of the firm to a great extent of course see there are various other factors because of which the volatility or standard deviation will be measured analysts employ a size based measure of variation the coefficient of variation for a variable uh, if uh, for a variable is standard deviation divided by its expected value so uh, what is coefficient of variation the formula is given standard deviation divided by the expected value or mean correct hello yes sir yeah so we will take a small example and understand this particular uh, uh, concept okay so how it is applicable so you will be getting a good idea about uh, how to you know uh, take decisions on this let's say a small example just a second coefficient of variation Just a second. Your book has no form, no question. So I'm just searching for a question. Yeah. So I've got an example. so stock xyz so i am writing the data here and how to take a decision also you should understand so what we are doing is we are scrut we are just scrutinizing three types of three potential investments we are considering okay so three potential investments being scrutinized here are stock of xyz okay and uh, market index you can say index stock let's say see xyz is a company index stock is nothing but there are two indexes in india we have bombay stock exchange and nifty that is national stock exchange it has 50 companies it has 30 companies this is also called as sensex new york stock exchange also has certain companies which are listed in them so list uh, index stock is nothing but on an average uh, you can take the returns what you get from one company is xyz all the 30 companies you are considering and the average returns from those 30 companies is nothing but the return from the bombay stock in Bo bombay stock exchange index stock that means there are 30 companies in this right the average returns of all those 30 companies what is the formula for average sum of observations by number of observations right or wrong yes sir so uh, the returns of all these 30 companies divided by number of companies it will give you average returns of this index stock or bombay stock exchange so and then we are taking a bond bond is let's say abc and this is def so stock is x stock of a individual company is xyz stock of a index is def and bond is abc see generally i would tell you this is least risky now with the help of coefficient of variation i'll prove you first of all i am telling you about their nature because bond is a security it has the backup of company's assets right the company has borrowed money from people and you know whenever you want to borrow money from a bank bank will ask you what come on tell me for a collateral yeah. is it yeah they'll ask you for some kind of security some asset to keep as collateral with them and then based upon that only they will give the loans to you why because you are no you are not a known person to bank even though you are a client of bank for a very big loan they can't trust you okay you should have that kind of capacity to pay them either they'll check your it returns see they will offer you 5 lakhs 10 lakhs loan by seeing your it returns but if it's at 1 crore 5 crore 2 crores and uh, they don't want to take that kind of risk so they'll keep the papers of the uh, they'll keep the property papers or documents with them the title deeds and they'll give the loan in the same way when company wants to borrow from you why will you trust a company or a bank you will ask them to give bonds or security which has the backup of their assets did you understand 
Isha and Bhargav? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, I know. I under. I hope you know what is a bond. Generally, if you don't know, you should be knowing. So, how the bonds are made is, let's say this is a bank. This is X Y Z individual. He wants to take loan from bank. So he deposits, or he he just goes to the bank, and whatever the property title deeds, he has a land, a building, and he you know mortgages them. or uh, keep kept, keeps them as collateral with the bank as a security because bank tells if you don't repay that loan what you are taking from us we will sell your property and we will get back our money bank has the right of lien okay so in this way bank makes itself very much safe and secured because they are not worried about mr x default only they will be worried when the property value is going very much down okay that is not the case because these are tangible assets and in prime location they don't expect that to happen in extreme cases war and all we cannot say but in general times these are appreciating assets only and flats and apartments in prime areas also get you good value so this is what is the case but let's say this bank they want to borrow from people what they will do now people also want some security right now you'll be asking me a question sir why a bank is borrowing from people see bank have to give loans to lot of people bank gets very less amount in deposits let's say someone is depositing 2000 rupees someone is depositing 5000 rupees but bank has to give loans of 1 crore 5 crores 10 crores how will they bring this money so what they do is they borrow from people they borrow from a, any place but what they do is they are very smart they will offer only 8% to people okay and they will borrow from people at the rate of 8% and they will give loans to the borrowers here bank is borrowing from lenders the lenders are also people and the borrowers are also people so bank is borrowing from people and offering them 8% interest and lending to other people and 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 you know charging 14% from them let's say from us they will borrow at 6% in indian context and 10% they will take from borrowers in this case bank is making good returns right 6% flat in this example what i have taken correct or wrong yes or no right sir yeah very simple but now people are worried about this bank because when bank was worried there is a natural case people will also be worried if this bank is you know becoming is going bankrupt how the banks go bankrupt i'll send the video you'll understand so banks can also go bankrupt boss because banks try too much to raise money and in that case they do certain kind of mistakes what those mistakes are you should be knowing i will be sending you now what banks are doing is they have assets of 100 crores okay let's say 10 lakhs how did they get this 10 lakhs assets see they have given loans to many people and their pe people's documents are with them property title deeds are with them and that is 10 lakhs let's say bank has assets of 10 lakhs boss this 10 lakh rupees worth of assets bank is going to convert into a bond of 1000 rupees how they will make promissory note so how many bonds they have to issue 10 lakhs so 1000 bonds they will issue to public to raise 10 lakh rupees each bond will be of value 1000 rupees every bond will be a promissory note in which it will be clearly written that this is a contract between me and you people as per which i am borrowing 1000 rupees from you and i promise you to pay this 1000 rupees i owe you 1000 rupees okay you take a, a bank note rbi uh, bank note and you will clearly see that rbi just give me a second just give me a second please keep a second okay
Yeah, sorry, there, I was taking a crucial class. So you take a note. If you take a, five, a 10 rupees note, 100 rupees note, 500 rupees note, you see something is written on that note. The governor of RBI gives a declaration. I owe you this 100 rupees, correct? I owe you this 10 rupees. How? What is the basis of that? Your 100 rupees note, 10 rupees note are also like bonds, promissory notes, bills. Did you understand? In US, they call it as bill. So why it is like that? And how uh, and on what basis the governor of RBI, whose declaration is considered a legal, uh, you know, declaration or uh, why we say the currency notes are legal tenders? Because in India, whatever RBI has the gold reserves, how much ever gold reserves they have, that much ever the notes are printed because that much capacity the RBI has to RBI has to pay you. That means if at all you go to a bank. OK, and ask for a loan, bank will ask you what assets you have. And how come you can guarantee me that you'll uh, make the payment of uh, so and so amount to me? So you ask a loan of 50 lakhs. You ask a loan of 50 lakhs and bank clearly tells you, asks you. When uh, see bank asks, the bank tells you that you are earning 3 lakh rupees per annum. OK, that is what your income, your particular uh, salary slip shows. You are earning 3 lakh rupees per annum. And you're asking me a loan of 50 lakhs on what basis I shall give you. What is your repaying capacity? Barely 3 lakh rupees per annum. If you earn 50 lakh rupees worth of loan, you're not eligible of. So he this particular uh, XYZ individual says I have some plot. Land OK, some plot or land OK, agriculture land, some gold, etc. So bank says what is the valuation of the assets? What you have? So he says my valuation is around 70 lakhs. Now bank can easily give this loan of 50 lakhs to him by taking uh, the assets of that much worth. Why? Because bank knows that he has that capacity to pay. So when you have the capacity to pay that much only loan you should take. That means the RBI can make the payment of this 100 rupees or whatever they are issuing in a particular one year. They will issue only those much of notes or those much amount of currency what capacity they have to pay and the capacity here would be the gold reserves what they hold. OK, did you understand my concept? Yes or no? Yes. I'm asking a question. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, so that is what is the crucial thing to know. So here what happens when company wants to borrow from you? So now company or bank wants to borrow from you. They have to give you some security. So the security what they are giving is a promissory note, which is which has some mention that I am borrowing so and so amount of thousand rupees from the lender and I owe thousand rupees to the lender. If I fail to pay, then they can take then see lender has all the right to approach the court. Why? Because the bank has clearly mentioned in the bond that they promise to make the payment of 1000 rupees and they are giving the backup of their assets or keeping the assets as collateral and uh, like uh, collateral the, the assets are collateral. OK, this particular security depicts that the assets are collateral or this particular bond. What the bank is issuing is a asset backed security. That means it has the backup of bank's assets like that thousand bonds they are issuing and every bond has a backup of the bank's assets. So all together all thousand bonds will have 10 lakh rupees worth of backup, right? Or sometimes what banks can do is they can they can appoint a trustee. And they can transfer all their assets in this trust. The trust will the trust which is run by the trustee, they will entrust the assets of the bank. That is a clear guarantee that in future when the bank will default, the trustee will sell the assets and give the money to the bondholders or the lenders OK to whom bank has given the security. That's what simple concept. OK, so now since you have seen all this story, uh, you clearly understood what is a bond. A bond is very, very secured asset because 
it's almost a security then comes the index stock index stock is nothing but stock markets stock which is very very safer than a individual company because here 30 companies are there so if at all five company goes into losses rest 25 companies can give returns so this losses can be adjusted with this returns and then net net you get returns but if at all you are investing in only one company so they say always there's a saying right don't put all the eggs in one basket because if that basket falls all the eggs would dam get damaged so what is the remedy the remedy is make a portfolio or diversify your investments that means put the put half dozen eggs in one basket and half dozen eggs in one basket and then you go if one one basket falls still one more basket is safe right so this is the riskiest one so the returns from this what you expect should be very high the returns so i'll write it here highest risk returns should also be expected highest okay moderate risk okay so less than this okay return should be less than this this is the least risky so risk is very less return should also be less okay and that we will prove with the help of the uh, coefficient of variation now see so again i'll put it very neatly so xyz stock def the index stock and the third one what i expect what i explained was what abc the bond right so the standard deviation of xyz stock is 15 percent and the expected return is 19 percent okay and the standard deviation of the stock market is eight percent so see the risk is decreasing here and the return is of 19 percent strange return should have been reduced right because here risk is high returns is high risk is less return should also be less but okay then the standard deviation of the bond is five percent see least risky and the return should also be eight percent okay now we will find out the coefficient of variation and we will discuss so the coefficient of variation formula coefficient of variation what is the formula for coefficient of variation standard deviation by x bar x bar, x bar x average x okay so 15 percent by 19 percent 8 percent by 19 percent 5 percent by 8 percent tell me what what is the answer 0 0.63 0 0.42 0 0.79 what does it mean here the variation is very high the volatility is high the risk is high the return should also be high right sure. here the returns should be maximum because the risk is highest correct or wrong yes sir so here the risk is uh, like somewhat less and the returns are also just a second So the ones who want to take the least risk. So here the coefficient of variation is the least actually. So this will be very, very, very less risky. Correct. Here the risk to reward ratio will be very good, right? Because for a risk of 8%, you're getting a returns of how much? 19%. Come on, tell me. Yes, sir. Hello? Yeah. So here the risk to reward ratio will be best and here the risk what you are taking the returns what you are getting is is a bit very less okay so investors uh, risk aversion differs from one investor to another Ris risk aversion is for less risk they want good returns because we all are rational people we are common man right so we always want to maximize the returns with with very less amount of risk so def is what can offer you that best risk to reward ratio that means the lowest risk since the risk is in the numerator and reward is in denominator. This means the lowest volatility percentage per unit of return. So the volatility is very less here. So very less volatility and very good returns. Correct or wrong? 
Excellent. So if a person is a very risk averse investor, he will reject this investment. Which one? X, Y, Z. Because for the given amount of highest risk, what he is getting is getting very less returns. Correct or wrong? Correct, sir. And here the risk is very less, but the returns are also very less. Not that good. Correct? So this is the best one. That is what the coefficient of variation helps you to take decision. This you will be studying in portfolio management also. My God, I wanted to finish this chapter, but see some concepts are coming, coming and I have to explain you everything. It seems very simple for you, but it's not that as you're seeing. So here coefficient of variation. So how you can find out the coefficient of variation of sales, standard deviation of sales by average sales, coefficient of variation of operating income, standard deviation of operating income by average operating income. And coefficient of variation of net uh, coefficient of variation of net income, standard deviation of net income by average of net income, right? Yes. Now, last and final question. Describe how ratio analysis and other techniques can be used to model and forecast earnings. See, ratio analysis can be used in preparing pro forma financial statements. What is pro forma financial statements? You can make your own uh, like draft statements, okay? Uh, and that provide estimates of financial items for one or more future periods. The preparation of pro forma financial statements and related forecast. So you can make your own draft statements and you can forecast the company's future. A forecast of financial results begins with an estimate of firms next period revenues. That means your nothing but ratios can help you to make draft statements and you can make your future predictions and estimations based upon your draft statements because you have done a thorough analysis and you have all the details and idea about how the performance of the company is and how you're expecting it to be. All right. Are you understanding? And uh, you can make future prediction of the company's performance and then what you can do? You can just uh, make uh, when the reality comes when actual statements are prepared you can compare your forecast with the actual statements and you can see how the how the performance has been right so there are some other methods also three methods of examining the variability of financial outcomes around point estimates are sensitivity analysis scenario analysis and simulation now i will not explain all this to you leave it this i will explain while i will be taking the subject of cons because if i take these three Again, I want one hour session, not required right now because however, I'll be discussing with you all this, right? So it is better for you to just read till here and close this and do the questions of ratios, which has been given to you. Next task is tomorrow we will finish TVM. Okay, I'll come early and as I already promised Bhargav, I'll be taking the class tomorrow. Okay, fine. Hello. Yes, sir. Yeah, yes, so finish sir. ratios. Ratios are done for you. Okay, thank you. Sir, doubt, sir. Yeah, yeah, please. Sir, about the scholarship thing I told, and uh, tomorrow I'll be busy from 4 to 5, sir. 4 to 5. Yeah, I'll call you within some time. I'll call you about that. Okay, sir. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, thank you. Sir. Thank you.